pleasure to invite to you, to invite to the podium practitioner, Carol Campbell, who will bring to you this morning's message. Put your hands together and welcome Carol. Good morning. And I know you had other places you could be this morning. <laughs> like Beijing, maybe. <laughs> so I thank you so much for choosing to be here this morning. And a very special welcome to those of you who are listening to us on the World Wide Web. Welcome. This morning, well, actually, this whole month, we've been focusing on freedom. And so this morning, I'd like to close out the month with my thoughts on personal freedom. When we think about freedom, what does it mean? Freedom really is more about release rather than escape. It's releasing the ego and its fears and being ready, willing, and able to be free in God rather than trying to escape from life. God is not a person, not even a personality, but it is the qualities of life already present in us. Joy, peace, love, prosperity, abundance, wholeness, perfection, intelligence, compassion, all that is already in us. Now, can you imagine what it could be like to live from that awareness? To be free in God is to be free to fearlessly be your authentic self, as joy bubbling up from an eternal spring, as love that heals and transforms, as peace that creates a bridge over troubled interactions, as prospering abundance that is lavishly generous and unlimited, as glowing, radiant health and confident wholeness. Wow, doesn't that feel good? But you know, the greatest ideas are only as good as our acceptance of them, and only as useful as our willingness to embody and experience them. That said, I've titled my message this morning, enough is enough. I think we know that expectation is what most often gets in the way of our experience of now and the good that is here present. If you have one eye on yesterday and one eye on tomorrow, you're going to be cockeyed today. <laughs> That's from the very prolific author, Anonymous. <laughs> but seriously, that's not to say you don't want good to happen. But what if we could accept that whatever is going on right now is good? Well, we know that what's going on in Beijing is very good. <laughs> Remember this. We were all given the kingdom in the beginning. We arrived with it intact. It is our business our divine assignment to demonstrate God in our lives, to live the qualities of God. So whatever is not serving the highest and best in us has to be discarded, disintegrated, allow the reveal. That's the breakdown before the breakthrough. And we've all experienced varying degrees of that, I'm sure. You lose your job. That's an opportunity to find a better job or learn a new skill. Your partner leave you for supposedly greener pastures? Now you can focus on being the best version of you and learn to appreciate yourself by watering your own grass and your own yard to make it green. <laughs> your children not working with the program? Well, now you can give them wings and watch them soar they have access to the same infinite intelligence that brought them here. Whatever is going on is good. When we decide to seek and find the good in ourselves, in others, and in every experience. 
And in truth, you know, you don't even have to seek for it because it is already there, awaiting our recognition of it. You see, life is not so much about becoming as it is about revealing. We are already all that we can be. Yes, we are. We're whole, we're perfect and complete in our God nature, which means we already possess the best of everything. It's about finding our true selves rather than seeking to create a newer, better person. It's about applying what we already know about who we are with wisdom, understanding, courage, and compassion to recognize to recognize is to know again. We can't recognize something that we didn't already know. We can't experience something that is not somehow already alive within us. Our experiences are generated from inside, not imposed from outside. We live from our conscious awareness. I'm going to read to you a short story it's from the book Women Who Run With the Wolves by Clarissa Pinkola Estes. The story is called The Red Shoes. It's quite short. Once there was a poor motherless child who had no shoes, but the child saved scrap cloth and wherever she found them, and over time sewed herself a pair of red shoes. They were crude, but she loved them. They made her feel rich, even though her days were spent gathering food in the thorny woods until far past dark. But one day, as she trudged down the road in her rags and her red shoes, a gilded carriage pulled up beside her. Inside was an old woman who told her she was going to take her home and treat her as her own little daughter. So to the wealthy old woman's house they went, and the child's hair was cleaned and combed, she was given pure white undergarments and a fine wool dress and white stockings and shiny black shoes. When the child asked for her old clothes and especially her red shoes, the old woman said the clothes were so filthy and the shoes so ridiculous that she threw them into the fire where they were burnt to ashes. The child was very sad, for even with all the riches surrounding her, the humble red shoes made by her own hand had given her the greatest happiness. Now she was made to sit still all the time, to walk without skipping, and to not speak unless spoken to. But a secret fire began to burn in her heart, and she continued to yearn for her old red shoes more than anything. As the child was old enough to be confirmed on the day of the innocence, the old woman took her to an old crippled shoemaker to have a special pair of shoes made for the occasion. In the shoemaker's case, there stood a pair of red shoes made of finest leather that were finer than fine. They practically glowed. So even though red shoes were scandalous for church, the child, who chose only with her hungry heart, picked up the red shoes. The old lady's eyesight was so poor, she could not see the color of the shoes, and so paid for them. The old shoemaker winked at the child and wrapped the shoes up. The next day, the church members were agog over the shoes on the child's feet. The red shoes shone like burnished apples, like hearts, like red-washed plums. Everyone stared. Even the icons on the wall, even the statues stared disapprovingly at her shoes. But she loved the shoes all the more. So when the pontiff intoned, the choir hummed, the organ pumped, the child thought nothing more beautiful than her red shoes. By the end of the day, the old woman had been informed about her ward's red shoes. Never, never wear those red shoes again, the old woman threatened. But the next Sunday, the child couldn't help but choose the red shoes over the black ones, and she and the old woman walked to church as usual. At the door to the church was an old soldier with his arm in a sling. He wore a little jacket and had a red beard. He bowed and asked permission to brush the dust from the child's shoes. The child put out her foot and he tapped the soles of her shoes with a little wiggy jiggy jig song that made the soles of her feet itch. Remember to stay for the dance, he smiled and winked at her. 
Again, everyone looked askance at the girl's red shoes, but she so loved the shoes that were bright like crimson, bright like pomegranates, that she could hardly think of anything else, hardly hear the service at all. So busy was she turning her feet this way and that, admiring her red shoes, that she forgot to sing. The old woman's coachman jumped up from his bench and ran after the girl. She had danced away from the church. Her feet began to move. They would not stop. She danced through the flower beds and around the corner of the church until it seemed as though she had lost complete control of herself. She did a gavotte and then a turn and then waltzed by herself through the fields across the way. The coachman picked her up and carried her back to the carriage, but the girl's feet in the red shoes were still dancing in the air as though they were still on the ground. The old woman and the coachman tugged and pulled, trying to pry the red shoes off. It was such a sight. All hats askew and kicking legs, but at last the girl's feet calmed. Back home, the old woman slammed the red shoes down high on a shelf and warned the girl never to touch them again. Not long after, as fate will have it, the old woman became bedridden. And as soon as her doctors left, the girl crept into the room where the red shoes were kept. She glanced up at them so high on the shelf. Her glance became a gaze, and her gaze became a powerful desire, so much so that the girl took the shoes from the shelf and put them on, feeling it would do no harm. But as soon as they touched her heels and toes, she was overcome by the urge to dance. And so out the door she danced, down the steps, first in a gavotte, then in a twirl, then in big daring waltz, turns into rapid succession. The girl was in her glory and did not realize that she was in trouble until she wanted to dance to the left and the shoes insisted on dancing to the right. When she wanted to dance round, the shoes insisted on dancing straight ahead. Hmm. As the shoes danced the girl rather than the other way around, they danced their way right down the road through the muddy fields and out into the dark and gloomy forest. There against the tree was the old soldier with the red beard, his arm in a sling, dressed in his little jacket. Oh my, he said, what beautiful dancing shoes. Terrified, she tried to pull the shoes off, but as much as she tugged, the shoes stayed fast. And so dance, and dance, and dance, and dance she did. Over highest hills, and through the valleys, and the rain, and the snow, and the sun she danced. She danced in the darkest night, through sunrise. She was still dancing in twilight. But it was not good dancing. It was terrible dancing, and there was no rest for her. The girl begged for mercy, but before she could plead further, her red shoes carried her away over the briars, through the streams, over the hedgerows, and on and on, dancing, still dancing till she came to her old home where there were mourners. The old woman who had taken her in had died. Yet even so, she danced on by, and dance she did as dance she must. In abject exhaustion and horror, she danced into the forest where lived the town's executioner. Please, she begged the executioner as she danced by his door, please cut off my shoes to free me from this horrid fate. And the executioner cut through the straps of the red shoes, but still the sh shoes stayed on her feet. So she cried to him that her life was worth nothing, that he should cut off her feet. So he cut off her feet. And the red shoes with the feet in them still kept on dancing. And now the girl was a poor cripple and had to find her own way in the world as a servant to others. And she never, ever again wished for red shoes. That's quite the story. <laughs> it may sound like a very tragic ending, but what is the lesson here? If like our girl in the story, you feel like you're at the mercy of some unseen force that is determined to drag you off course from your divine plan, how do you reclaim your power to be you, to stand up and be counted as the free and unlimited expression of joy, of love, and light, and creativity, and passion that you truly are? As you may recall, in our story, our little girl starts off by deliberately fashioning a better expression of life, represented by the red shoes, out of the scraps of her existence using her own special innovative talents and skills. Those shoes represented for her 
an enormous and literal step up in her life. She had no shoes before, but recognized that she had the ability to create shoes, and not just any shoes, but red shoes that indicate the possibility of vibrant, passionate, joyous life. Her evolution had begun because she recognized the more that was possible. But then she got sidetracked and allowed someone else, life circumstances, doubts, fear, the seduction of grandeur, to call the shots. She lost her way, quite literally, gave her power away, and was never again able to reconnect with the source of her joy. She never took the time to get in touch with her soul self and to get the help needed to make another pair of shoes. Instead, she is catapulted out of control, running every which way, seeking assistance from the shoemaker, the hunter, the soldier, the executioner, trapped in her own external pursuit of happiness. She is totally bereft of any sense of self at this point. She just wants to escape. You ever feel like that? Hmm. I know I have. But friends, our good is never out there. Your living stops when you look outside yourself for your good. Unless we can find the way to hold our own joy and self-worth secure in our own hearts, we can be seduced away from our true nature, and we may never know how truly magnificent we are. But unlike our girl in the story, all is not lost. As long as we are alive and kicking, there's something active within us that wants to express through us as abundant life, as unquenchable joy. So don't waste time rehashing mistakes and the poor choices that led us straight to the executioner's door. Begin to dismantle the seductive traps and find our way back home to that deep inner connection with our soul self, that inner source of wisdom and light and joy. How do we do this? There are several tools. I can't stress enough the necessity of practicing meditation regularly, at the very least 20 minutes every day. Ideally, it should be twice a day, but once is a good start. It's the surest way to connect with our soul power. If you'd like to know how, please call the office and make an appointment. We meet here every Monday evening at 6 for meditation, but you need to call the office first if you've never meditated before. The Bhagavad Gita, that ancient wisdom written sometime around 400 BC, gives us four simple keys to living an exceptional life. And I'm paraphrasing here. First, find your divine purpose and live it. We're told that people who are living their purpose live longer and happier lives. Two, do it with all your heart. Dr. Tom Johnson in his book, You Are Your Own Experience says, the only way to be free of yesterday is to be fully involved with today. Three, be on purpose. That is, focus on meaningful service, determined to make a difference in the world. Four, let go and let God. How often have we heard that? God doesn't need our help to do, really. But he does need our help to be. Being the expression of God is what we're here for. Dr. John Waterhouse, president of Centers for Spiritual Living, in his book, Five Steps to Freedom, outlines in very simple language the steps of spiritual mind treatment, otherwise called affirmative prayer, which is the cornerstone of this teaching. In his own words, the book is about, and I quote, freeing ourselves from those limiting thoughts and beliefs that have kept us from living the lives we so deeply desire. This is the freedom that satisfies our thirst for significance and contentment, end quote. In short, affirmative prayer opens us to a deeper understanding of spiritual principles that can effect 
positive changes in our lives. I would encourage you to check the bookshop for copies of his book or take a class to know more about this. Now in your program, I've included an affirmative prayer to remind you that never again do you need to be shackled to error thinking and its old worn out ideas of unworthiness and inadequacy because you are the living expression of the living spirit almighty. Therefore, you are enough. I'd like us to read it now, but please take it with you and read it every time you feel you need a boost. A treatment of self-acceptance. It's printed in the program. The epigraph reads, you are the deepest wisdom and the highest truth, the greatest peace and the grandest love. You are these things. Choose now to know yourself as these things always. That's a quotation from Neil Donald Walsh. Together, I deserve. God is infinite life, ever expanding into greater ideas of self-expression. It is forever calling me to come up higher in consciousness and experience the elevated view from the mountaintop of my conscious awareness. From this perspective, I know myself as an individualized expression of this lifeward impulse. My heart opens to the urgings of infinite intelligence that invites me to allow my fullest potential to be realized in peace, in joy, love, light, abundance, wholeness, and beauty. Accepting my deservedness to experience the best life has to offer, I allow old patterns and ideas that no longer serve me to dissolve into nothingness. The truth of my being reveals itself magnificently. God is in me as me. Surrendering to the wonder and expansiveness of this idea, I move from success to greater success, from joy to greater joy, from love to greater love, from good to amazing experiences as I embrace new exciting opportunities for my growth and unfoldment. In confident assurance of perpetual good unfolding as my life, I let my good happen, anticipating abundant expressions of love, joy, peace, and harmony to greet me at every turn. I am truly free in God, the life that lives through me. With gratitude, I release these words to law knowing they are already fulfilled, and so it is. And so it is, don't ever forget, enough is enough, and you are enough. <laughs>